But let's get to our panel here in the studio. Ambassador Earl Anthony Wayne, he's the former US ambassador to Mexico and a public policy fellow at the Wilson Center. Also with us is Manuel Suarez Mia. He is a Latin American uh, economic consultant. Carlo Dade is the director of Trade and Investment Center at the Canada West Foundation. He joins us from out west in Calgary. And here in the studio is Heather Long, the economics correspondent for the Washington Post. Welcome uh, to you all. Uh, let's start with you, Manuel. Um, there was quite a lot of surprise uh, that Mexico signed on to this. What's in it for Mexico, and what does it mean for the other country left out, Canada? Well, NAFTA is very important for Mexico in many mm -hmm. respects. Mexico is far more open economy than the U.S. That means that uh, a larger share of the economy and employment in Mexico is tied to trade with the U.S. 80% of Mexico's exports go to the U.S. So that means that... So were they pushed into it a little bit by the Trump administration? Well, it, it was a tough negotiation, but in the end, if you look at the details of what came out, it's much better than the alternative pr first proposed by the Trump administration or no, no deal at all. So in the context uh, of uh, what was viable to negotiate, I think it was, it's a fairly good negotiation. We can get into the details uh, if you wish a bit later on. Oh, well, we'll tell, let's go. I was telling you to pick up on those details. So Jessica touched on a few of them. Um, a lot more uh, higher wages, uh, more uh, North American content. Um, is this a deal that Mexico and the US can live with and push through? And there's a political timetable, of course, going on here as well. And can Canada sign on? Well, I think it is a deal that they can both live with. The key thing is that Canada is so integrated into the auto industry that it really doesn't make sense if they aren't part of this agreement. So that's, that's really very important. And that changes the dynamic of the percentages that have been agreed. It will be, would be really hard if Canada wasn't there to meet these new North American standards. But the other thing that's going to be really important is to hear from the auto industry. How burdensome will this be? Okay. How much will it raise prices? We have to remember that North American U.S. companies export about 20% of their production. So those autos still have to be competitive around the world. Well, I, I wanted to go to uh, Car uh, Carla to talk about Canada, but while we have you on this, um, I just want to speak to Heather, because she, she's a journalist, obviously looks at the economics uh, of all this. Under, under this deal, we don't have all the details, 75% of autos must be made in North America. That's up from 62 and a half. 40 to 45% of the value, or, or, or a word like that, must uh, be made by workers earning at least $16 an hour. What does that do? It's pretty simple on the economic side that this is going to raise prices for cars and trucks sold in the United States. Uh, if you're going to be paying workers more, whether in the United States or in Mexico, to make these cars, those costs have to go somewhere and they're likely to go through to consumers. Uh, the White House and the Trump administration has been arguing from the beginning that that's a trade-off that's worth it. Let's pay a little bit more money for some of our products to save jobs here in this country. So it basically means more auto jobs, I presume, being in the U.S. and Canada, because a uh, Mexican average auto worker earns around $3, $54 an hour. Is, is that what's really behind this? Make, a, uh, make America great again, one auto job at a time? That's what the White House really hopes is going to happen with this, more jobs in the United States. The question, as was alluded to earlier, is, are, is Ford and GM and other manufacturers really going to want to do this, or will they just continue to produce more in Mexico or in other countries, and then they could import and only face a 2.5% tariff at the moment if they ignored those rules? Absolutely. I want to get onto that in a minute, but I want to bring in, in Carlo here. Um, we talked about GM, we talked about Ford. Um, these aren't just American car makers, though, are they? They're global, and a lot of their production and a lot of their parts come from Canada. In fact, probably even more in terms of value than, than Mexico. So what's going on here? And is Ottawa going to bend or, or, or agree to this? Uh, um, Foreign Minister Freeland seemed to be quite positive. Well, the deal, the details of the deal we have now sound like it would be favorable towards Canada, requiring more content from a higher cost economy or a place where wages are higher. But I would caution that, you know, the economics of this may sound simple, 
but the implementation, I'm still mm -hmm. scratching my head as to how are you going to ascertain wage rates for a variety of parts that go into cars, some of which are destined for the U.S., some of which Mexico is shipping uh, to South America. Uh, how are you going to make this calculation? Who's going to make it? How are you going to determine it? The idea may sound simple, but I'm still scratching my head uh, around the finer points of how we're actually going to work this out and how we're actually going to implement it. So I, I, would, I would caution that we have the idea, but we don't have the details yet. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. And Carla, do you think that, that, that Ottawa will sign on by Friday? Well, it depends. You know, the issue for Canada, uh, of course, autos is extremely important, but investor state is uh, extremely important for us as well. The sunset clause, but supply management. This government is going to have to make concessions on Canada's system of supply management for dairy, poultry, eggs, turkey, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And can it make concessions? Well, yes, we made concessions to the Americans already in the TPP. Uh, and that is a starting point. We certainly can make concessions. The question is, will the government actually do it? We've done polling showing that Canadians would support the government making concessions to save NAFTA. But again, the government needed something to really push them into doing this. I think this may have finally, finally done it, given them enough cover to make the decision everyone knows they had to make. Thank you. Ambassador Wayne, uh, we have a political clock running here in Mexico because the uh, outgoing president, Peña Nieto, uh, leaves. And we have the incoming president, who's more left, may want some changes, more for Mexico labor, et cetera, et cetera. And we also have a timetable with the U.S. Congress to get through uh, before perhaps the House of Representatives changes hands. So is this why we're seeing this sort of push for a deal? Or is it because everyone pretty much realizes they have to make a deal at some stage? No, you're exactly right. The timing has pushed the U.S. and Mexico to move very quickly to try and get this done so it can be signed by December 1st, if possible. December 1st is the day of transition from the current president of Mexico to the new president of Mexico. Both of those Mexican presidents seem agreed it would be good to get this signed before that December 1st transition, if possible. That then means in the United States, because of TPA legislation, Trade Promotion Authority legislation. That, that means Congress basically has to pass it up or down without putting amendments well, on it, right? And they need to be notified by the 1st of September to have a 90-day period by December 1st. Right. So it could be signed. So this is re there are tight. really tight schedules here. And that means you have this tight negotiation. But it doesn't mean the agreement has to be all done by Friday. And it won't be because right now, even with Mexico, we just have an agreement in principle. I'm glad you mentioned this because so the deal can be worked out along the way of this 90 days because there's still a lot to work out, isn't there, Manuel? I'm right in saying that there's tariffs already of Mexico and, uh, and uh, Canada when it comes to steel and aluminum, correct? Yes. No real mention of if, when are those going away. Are they still going to be there with an auto agreement because tariffs are too low? I mean, there's a lot to be worked out here. Yeah, all the details have to be worked out. But that's a big one, tariffs on your biggest trading partners who you're hoping to get a deal with. Sure. And, and it, as, as Heather said, it, it, it results in raising the costs and eventually the price of goods in, in the U.S. Uh, let me go back for a second to the labor provision, which sure. is very important. Uh, only 40 to 45 uh, percent of the labor involved in auto parts and auto making uh, is covered by this requirement of $16 per hour. That, that leaves 70% of the auto industry and parts can qualify. They, 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 they don't have to be exactly. made by somebody who's earning 16 and, bucks an and, hour. And yeah. the rest can go using uh, most preferred nation treatment under WTO rules. Right. and pay 2.5% um, tariff. So it, it, it's really not the overwhelming sort of thing that everyone or some people have made it to be. It's, it's a, a marginal nuisance. And by the way, there's a five-year uh, period of adjustment. Oh, that's right. I thought they were going to face it over three, but I think you're right. Five years yeah. for that clause and three for the, for the, um, uh, for the percentage. Um, Heather, um, 
We talk, touched on this before, but supply chains in NAFTA are, are well integrated. They have been for decades. But there's one country's supply chain uh, that the US has really been challenging, and that is China. Is it, it, making this deal with, with Mexico now, is that really, when you're thinking about it, making, trying to make sure supply chains are staying within NAFTA within North America and building upon that, do you think? I think that's the goal here, and that's probably the, one of the more positive things that could come out of this. Cars are basically becoming computers. You know, when you get in, there's all these buttons to push now. And one of the problems, or maybe problems, if, depending on how you look at it, in the auto industry is that most of those electronic components are coming from Asia, not just from China, but South Korea as mm. well. And so th there's been this push in the United States, why aren't we making those here? Or why aren't we making those anywhere in North America? Mexico has cheaper labor. If, if labor costs are the problem, let's make more of those technologies there. And certainly when you look at cars like Tesla that are coming out that are even more highly engineered and highly computerized, that's the future of automaking. And we want to see more of that in North America. Um, uh, do you think this will have any effect, just to follow up? Because I read Goldman Sachs today said, you know, all this back and forth, we don't think it's going to have any impact whatsoever. Oh, you mean in the auto sector? Yeah. Well, it remains to be seen. It was, I was also talking to some auto labor leaders, and they've sort of said what everybody else has said, which is we await the details of how you actually calculate and in particular enforce these regulations. That's really going to come down to whether or not this forces supply chains to move or this forces factories to move across borders or wages to go up or down. Uh, Carla, you were nodding there, um, and you agree. But obviously, you know, Canada is also part of another... Uh, grouping, which is uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, you know, did, how do these two potential deals uh, overlap or complement each other, or do they not? Well, we also have an agreement with the European Union that Absolutely. is partially yeah. in effect. You know, there were worries with the negotiation of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, about you know, the supply chains that we have and the parts that we're, that we're getting. Uh, we also have you know, other manufacturers from Japan and Canada, Toyota is here, Honda is here. So you know, that turned out not to be much of an issue uh, in terms of our negotiations with the TPP, partially because Mexico also has a pact with the EU that's been updated recently, and Mexico is also part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So between the, you know, the, the, the two of us, there haven't been many worries. Of course, we're now going to have to go back with whatever deal has been worked out uh, as part of NAFTA and go back and, and revisit that. I want to talk about Donald Trump. Um, before I get to you, Ambassador, let's just play a, a little clip of what he had said of the last 24 hours. I like to call this deal the United States-Mexico Trade Agreement. I think it's an elegant name. I think NAFTA has a lot of bad connotations for the United States because it was a ripoff. It was a deal that was a horrible deal for our country. And uh, I think it's got a lot of bad connotations to a lot of people. And so we will uh, probably, uh, you and I will agree to uh, the name. Now, Ambassador Wayne, you know fully well that Donald Trump campaigned on replacing NAFTA, if not yanking it. Um, is this a success? And considering he's um, known for the art of the deal, we actually haven't had many deals, have we, uh, in the first nearly two years of his presidency? Does he need this before going into? You did a zero. I mean, you could argue against it, but uh, is this is this a, 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 a must-have before going into the midterm elections, for example? I think it could be an important boost to show that he's completed one agreement. That's why it's very important to bring Canada on board here, because there will be a lot of people in the U.S. Congress, for example, that won't want to approve an accord unless Canada is there. We have to remember Canada is the largest trading partner of the United States. Mexico is number three. So if both of them are together, that's powerful. Um, and it's important that we have the agreement with Mexico, but Canada is going to make this a whole. Uh, Heather, what do you think? I mean, you know, you cover Trump's Washington. You know how optics are as important as the, the substance, uh, sometimes more so. Uh, apart from an update of the Korean Free Trade Agreement, it doesn't seem like there's been anything else. Is, is this a big 
thing for the White House. It's very much needed for him to have a win here. And that's the language he was using yesterday was trying to characterize that. Two quick points. Number one, the South Korea deal has not been signed no, yet. Or ratified so it, in Seoul. It was You're also an right. agreement in principle, very much like the Mexico announcement that happened in March. We still haven't seen final text. So there's, that's what we mean by zero wins so far. I think the second point, you could see the stress today by Republicans, is Trump has been, President Trump has been struggling with farmers. Uh, the agriculture sector is very upset about the tariffs on soybeans and other goods from China. Uh, updating NAFTA is very important to farmers, and they uh, want to see this deal and see uh, get a, perceived as a win for them as well. So politically, going into the midterms, I think that's key here. And farmers, though, do uh, so much more trade with Canada than they mm -hmm. do Mexico. Hence the, <laughs> hence the. Um, uh, Carlo, you mentioned uh, Europe, um, but also you know uh, Trudeau has his constituencies within Canada as well. Let, let's have a listen uh, uh, to the Prime Minister and uh, work out whether they can get a deal by Friday. Our team is right now in Washington uh, digging into uh, the progress made and looking at what the next steps are. We will engage uh, in a positive and constructive way as we always have been uh, and look forward to uh, ultimately signing a deal as long as it is good for Canada uh, and good for middle class Canadians. Uh, Carlo Dade in, in Calgary, um, what, uh, what political risks has uh, the Trudeau government got here in, in signing a deal by Friday. Uh, we've mentioned dairy. There are other aspects of the Canadian economy too, I'm sure. Well, you know, autos, of course. Autos, the, the auto sector greatly influenced our participation, or some would say lack thereof, at key points in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So the government has to balance the interest of the auto sector uh, against the interest of the dairy sector, balanced in the sense that we have elections in this country in 2019. The government the, that's in power, the Trudeau government, the Liberals, want to hold on to majority in Parliament. They're going to need key ridings in Quebec. So this is where fears of a backlash from the dairy sector, which is heavily concentrated in Quebec, um, come into play. But I would just note uh, on the previous point, too, you know, Congress has the power to regulate trade according to the U.S. Constitution. Congress cedes that power to the president. When they do so, they provide very specific instructions. With NAFTA, under the Trade Promotion Authority, Congress gave the president permission to renegotiate NAFTA, to renegotiate a trilateral agreement, not to show up at the last minute without <laughs> any advice or consultation with a bilateral agreement. So we're already seeing pushback from Orrin Hatch, um, Sherrod Brown, uh, Ron Wyden, and other senators saying, you know, wait a minute, we're going to do the bare minimum of our jobs, and that's to enforce the TPA. So from the Canadian perspective, we just don't see how this president is going to succeed in convincing Congress to suddenly at the last minute out of the blue take a bilateral agreement. Heather, you want to add something here? I completely agree with Carlix except for one important point. And that is the president believes that he has the ability to pull out of NAFTA. And so if this is a deal or no deal, that changes the stakes. If you're a Republican senator who's representing a state, the, your worst nightmare is to have no NAFTA. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because of all the columns I read, uh, you, know, you, you, you get this message time and time again, usually from anonymous uh, Republican uh, lawmakers saying, well, at least he's not dumping it. Um, so there might be this pushback, um, Ambassador Wade, uh, on the fact that uh, whether you can do it with Canada or without or whatever, but, but people are, uh, seem to be relieved that he hasn't gone through with dumping NAFTA. Is that the case? Is that where we are? Well, there's a realization that it could cost a million or more U.S. jobs if you pulled out of NAFTA. And that would be a big negative. I think for everybody, though, it's kind of that option that you can threaten, but what would be the penalty if you actually took it. So it is sure. something you want to avoid, for sure. Um, but I think there'll be a lot of pressure not to actually do that. Carlos, sorry, you just wanted to come in quickly? Yeah, so we've done modeling up here in Canada. Uh, the team that did our modeling for the Trans-Pacific Partnership has modeled a U.S. withdrawal from NAFTA, and the Bank of International Settlements did similar modeling, I think, just last mm -hmm. week. You know, in Canada, we're looking at a 2.2% hit to GDP if 
the NAFTA ends. And less than that if the U.S. withdraws and leaves us with a bilateral agreement with Mexico. So taking a look at the modeling, which isn't definitive, but it's an introduction to, to the, the possible post-NAFTA reality, the modeling indicates to us that it would be harmful, but we could certainly survive it, especially if we keep a bilateral agreement with Mexico and take market share off the Americans in Mexico. Uh, and Manuel, I presume uh, Mexico has done similar calculations. Uh, Latin Americans, obviously, with the aluminum and steel, have had to, and I can guarantee that people in Beijing are doing it too. Have we got to this moment where actually uh, the threats that the, the Trump administration used are actually now becoming real and Absolutely. people are having to calculate? Absolutely. Well, first of all, let me, let me make a, a clear distinction between what, what was negotiated by the adults in the negotiating room and the reality show in the White House. It, it's a complete divorce. There is no correlation whatsoever. In my dealing with U.S. trade officials, I, I exactly, see where you're going. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we have a, a fairly serious deal on the table with its flaws and its drawbacks, but it, it, it's, it's something we can work at. Nothing to do with the rhetoric at, at the okay. White House. Second, uh, the, the ball has been rolling for Mexico to finally di seriously diversify its trade. So we, see, we have started looking at uh, supplies of grains in South America and Ukraine. We already have deals with Brazil and Argentina. Uh, and uh, we are in talks with China to also deal with our, our very lopsided uh, relationship. Mexico has a large uh, deficit uh, with, with China mm. that has to be redressed. Um, not for the, the reasons that Mr. Trump wants in, in, the, in our bilateral cases, but uh, for reasons that we are not selling enough to China, and we can, and uh, we have to open those markets. Mm. So okay. the, the, that ball is rolling. Um, somebody said to me that, that, that this seemed to be Mexico um, actually betting on North America more than its internationalization. Do you agree? It, it was the case, but I think now we are... Uh, in, bear in mind that Mexico has 45 free trade agreements with everyone virtually, right, right, right. more than anyone else. So what we have not done is to work at promoting the, those other trade agreements. Okay, I want to go around the table because I, I think we've got time for one more question each. Um, okay, so uh, US President lo loves to focus on trade deficits, as Manuel just said, uh, and also wants factory jobs, well-paying factory jobs to come back to the USA. Will this agreement, or whatever it is, do that, Ambassador First? It should create some additional economic activity <laughs> in the United States in the auto sector. How much, we're not going to know till we know more of the details. That was such a diplomatic answer, <laughs> economic <laughs> activity, because it could be taken away from somewhere else, right? Well, it, it could, but probably it will add some, and it will in North America, perhaps create some more trade in North America that you're not bringing in parts from other parts of the world. How much we won't know till we know the details and we see it function. Carlos, same question. Will it reduce the trade deficit that uh, the US president complained so much? And will factory jobs come back to North America? And obviously the US is his main concern. Hmm. I would split the trade deficit question, as we do in Canada, into <laughs> services and goods. <laughs> they do that, uh, but, too. But, but we're not, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna fight that battle here. I think it will keep jobs in North America. Look, countries don't compete as countries uh, on the trade front. You compete as teams, as part of a trade block. This will enable the United States to take advantages of not just cheaper labor, but research and development and talent in Mexico, research and development and talent in Canada to be able to compete against other trade blocks. In Mexico and Canada, we have alternatives. We have two other NAFTAs. We're part of the TPP, and we both have agreements with the European Union. We have alternatives. The Americans don't. So I would argue that to remain competitive globally in the world of trade blocks, they really need this. Well, that was a good commercial for Canada. Heather, Heather Long, uh, <laughs> final word. Uh, is this going to bring uh, back jobs to the US, factory jobs that uh, uh, the president has said of other countries have taken? And what about the trade deficit? I think the best way to say it is this is going to make North America great again. So probably more jobs in North America. But are they going to be in Ohio or in Michigan? That's an impossible to say right now. Uh, in terms of trade deficit, probably very minimal impact. Yeah, because uh, if you close uh -huh. a trade deficit somewhere, 
it pops up somewhere else. But keep it? in mind, we don't have a trade deficit with Canada, so. <laughs> Especially when you count in services. Yeah. And you could argue it's very, uh, it's little when you do that with China. But it's fascinating discussion. I'm, I wish we'd had another half an hour, but we don't. So I want to thank all our guests here in DC and also out in Calgary as well. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Nathan King in Washington, DC. Thanks so much for being with us. See you soon.